I titled this uh, presentation Design for Autonomous. Um, so I've separated it into two parts. Uh, the first part is about how our team approaches the autonomous section of the game. Um, and then the second part is the implementation. Um, so I go through you know, some of the steps we use to implement those ideas uh, I talk about in the first part. Um, but this is kind of overviewing how we have gone uh, about approaching the autonomous mode on bread. Um, and you know, hopefully it's informative. Um, throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, just like raise your hand. Um, and if it's a quick one, we'll just you know, stop and talk about it for a bit. Um, otherwise, we'll address it at the end. Um, but it's kind of more fun if we have a, a back and forth during the talk. So, uh, Yeah, so we're going to walk through the whole process um, of going from nothing, from game release. Um, through to a high-performing autonomous mode for the game. Uh, my name's Griffin. Uh, I'm a technical mentor and drive coach for 5940. So if you're you know, part of a drive team in California, you've probably seen me. Um, I used to work as a physical in physical security testing. Uh, now I'm a system engineer uh, with Apple's Satellite Connectivity Group. Um, I also just got a new cat. She's really cute. Um, so. The first thing I do when uh, a new game comes out uh, is I always scroll down to the, the game section. I look for this table. Um, this table basically explains you know, what you could possibly do during the game to get points. Um, and they nicely separate it out for us into autonomous and teleop. Um, and so we're going to focus on the auto section here. So right when this comes out, uh, we're thinking, you know, how, how, how should we use the autonomous mode of the, of the game? Uh, what advantage can we possibly gain? Um, and there's some obvious ones, and there's some less obvious ones. Uh, so, you know, sometimes there are bonus points that are only available uh, during the autonomous section. Um, if, you know, if you look at this and compare it to the teleop section, um, regardless of where you're scoring, you're going to get plus one bonus point, right? So if, if you don't score those pieces during auto, those are, those are points that you can never get later in the game. Um, yeah, and that's what I'm talking about with the delta between those two. Um, you know, even, even if there's not a large bonus associated with this, the autonomous mode is still getting an early lead in the match. Uh, one of the way, ways we think about it is like the real match starts after those 15 seconds ends. Um, so if you're really good in autonomous, you basically start the match with a, with a lead, um, which is really helpful, um, especially in some games. But you know, there are more possible, uh, there are more possible ways that you can use the autonomous mode to your advantage. Um, one of them is uh, just getting a short cycle, right? So this is a top-down view of the field this year. Um, so normally when you're cycling, uh, you'll have to go from here all the way across the field over to the other side. Um, but in the autonomous mode, they nicely pre-stage these pieces here. So if, if you can use those, if you can score those for your team, that's essentially a shorter cycle. Instead of having to drive all the way across the field to pick up the game piece, instead you can just drive to pick one up here. Um, but critically, you know, it's also a removal of a short cycle for your opponent. If, if your alliance leaves these out on the field um, after autonomous ends, um, and your opponents are you know, quick off the line when uh, the buzzer sounds, um, that, those pieces might be a short cycle for them. So it's not just a loss of a cycle for you, it's actually a gain of a cycle for your opponent. Um, so it's important to think about the delta there. Um, you know, another sort of less uh, obvious game you can get out of the autonomous mode is uh, just field positioning. Um, if you watch some teams' autonomous modes, um, you know, they'll, they'll do a couple pieces and they'll, they'll place their last one, but then they'll just stay there in front of like the peg they paste, placed on. Um, if teams have time, um, what they'll usually do is actually just drive back to the middle. Because um, you, you can't cross the midline during autonomous. Um, but if you get close here, that's, you know, that's driving time you've saved off of your, uh, off of your next cycle. Um, and this kind of you know, field positioning, um, removing easy scoring opportunities for your opponents are usually in those kind of like the optimization of an autonomous mode after you're already just scoring some pieces. Um, and so 
these are some of the things we're looking about when we're going to, to choose what autos we're going to do. Um, but there's, you know, there's even more if we're thinking about the whole tournament, not just winning a match. Um, so the whole qualification section of the game, um, the point of it is to try to rank high. Um, and there's, you know, there's a first sort, your ranking score, which is how many, how many wins you got or how many extra RPs you got. Um, but if you tie on that, which happens a lot, um, there's an X sort. Um, and for this game and a lot of past games, um, it used to be different, but it's usually been this, um, is the next sort will be average alliance match points. So it's just whoever had a higher score on average. Um, we'll come back to that. Uh, but then there's yet another place that this matters um, for the playoff tiebreakers. So uh, if you're in the qualification matches and you tie, you, you just get a tie score, each side gets one ranking point. If you're playing in the playoffs and you're not in the finals, that tie gets broken and one of those alliances actually wins and proceeds. Um, so the first sort um, is wh whoever played the cleaner match. Um, next one being the end game, alliance station charge points. Um, and then the third sort is those auto points. Um, and you know, we're approaching this from game release, right? So remember the pre-champs rules. There's no super, uh, there's no super charging yet. Um, and if we go to look at the qualification ranking, you know, this is unlikely to matter, right? The chance that you tie another team after playing all of your qualification matches and end up with exactly the same average match score is like zero. The, the ties always get broken on this. Um, so the fact that you know, your seeding might be broken by average auto points, that's not gonna happen. Um, but if we think about the playoffs, um, if both sides play a clean match, you know, which is likely, happens a lot, um, you tie on that first one. So it's gotta go to the second sort. Um, and then, you know, if this is a really competitive event, both alliances are going to triple balance at the end. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's likely that, Thank you. you know, you could have a tie there as well. So, you know, it's reasonable that in the playoffs for this game, you would end up with a tie broken on auto points. Um, so, you know, doing well in autonomous, it's not just important for, uh, for playing uh, or for winning matches. It was also potentially important just for getting the tiebreaker. Um, and I have, I have full grid here um, because we're talking about the pre-champs rules. Um, and if you analyze the game in the beginning and you think, oh, well, these championship alliances might actually fill the entire grid and then do a triple balance, well, the only points left to uh, potentially win on is causing your opponent to get a foul, drawing a foul, or playing better in the auto mode than them. Um, so, you know, when we saw this game come out, we were like, wow, auto is going to be really important this year. Um, and so we put a lot of effort into it. So uh, when the game gets released, one of the first things we think about is what is even possible in auto? Um, and we think about this from like the highest level the best auto you could possibly do, like what is the best auto in the world gonna look like? Like, I don't know if we're gonna be able to achieve it, but what is the, the best anyone could possibly do? Um, and so we try to estimate this. Um, and you know, one way we do it is um, we, uh, we do like human matches, right? So we'll say like, okay, well the scoring location is here and you start here and you gotta go pick up a piece 15 feet away. Um, and one of the students will just like walk it out or jog it out. Someone sits there with a timer. You give them 15 seconds. Um, and everyone kind of watches and it's like, yeah, I think a robot would move that fast or there's no way a robot's going to move that fast. Um, and then another, another more uh, technical way you could do it is pull out a, actually like an auto um, path planning tool, like path planner, um, and just draw out the autonomous mode that you think a robot might be trying to do. Um, and then on your computer, you can time it and say, you know, would we have enough time to go get a piece or place a piece and go get a piece, place another one, go get another piece, place another one, go get another piece? Like, is there time for that? Um, and these are, these are the ways we figure it out. Usually it works, it works pretty well. Uh, 
So you know, with all this in mind, um, it's time to kind of down select. Because if you, you know, think through all, all the possible things you could possibly do in auto, there's, there's way too many to ever implement. Um, so we have to kind of order what our priority list is going to be. Um, but it matters what section of the game we're thinking about. So for the qualifications, the situation is likely different than it will be in the playoffs. Um, for the qualifications, you know, we're imagining it's a randomly selected match, um, and there's probably not going to be a lot of help for our alliance. That's the way we approach it, right? You, you plan for your robot being the best robot on the field. Because um, you don't want to rely on your partners because you can't control what they do. Um, so the, uh, we're trying to maximize our score, knowing that our partners are going to run some autonomous. Um, so, you know, you can't come up with an autonomous mode that's like, yeah, we're going to place one, go out of the community, drive around the charge station three times, and then go back in and score another one because your partners are there. There's no um, way you're going to be able to. After we discovered a call and and how much so that's qual. Uh, and then playoffs is different, though, because, you know, if you're trying to win the event, so then that is you're going to be like paired with another very good robot. On the, robot. the chances that you win the event and you're not playing with a very good robot Merchant um, and team are small. Small that's how the playoffs work. Um, However, we so have this for the playoffs, we're saying, OK, if we have example, one other partner that's very good, uh, what uh, what auto do we want in that case? Um, um, and how do these auto we're, modes complement each other? We're willing to sponsor that event. And we put their logo everywhere. So for 2023, uh, you know, with all that in mind, we made our list. So um, important thing and so number one that we wanted to have was that you we wanted to be able to do three pieces of balance. Um, when you know we saw the game get released, we were like, this is the best anyone's ever going to do. Like, there's no more time to do anything more than this. Um, so that's our number one goal. We're shooting for that. Um, we didn't achieve this until our second event. Um, but you know that was what we were aiming for. I think we only did two in balance at our first event. Um, and then there were other ones for different scenarios. Um, so, you know, we also had a three-piece, no balance, but drive over the bump side. Um, and the scenario for that is that you're playing with someone who has a good smooth side auto. Um, and so that's like your primary playoff strategy, right? If you're not running this, well, the other good robot's probably running this, so you're running this. Um, and, th and then there's kind of another, there's, there's more down here for the more niche scenarios. Um, so we were thinking of, um, OK, well, what if, what if we're going into a match in Qualls where um, we think we're going to win, but the, uh, the RP threshold for the links is going to be really hard to hit. Um, so in that case, we were just trying to get as many game pieces as physically possible into the community and just make any link out of them. Um, if you think back to some of the earlier events uh, in the year, um, there was a lot of teams that were actually just purposely scoring low, even if they had robots that could score high, because it was just a little bit faster, and they were really trying to hit the link RP. Um, so this was the, the strategy for that. Um, three no balance. Uh, maybe you play with a team uh, where like their only auto mode is they're in the middle and they balance on the charge station. Um, and you know if your scouting data says it works well, well you want to let them run that. Um, so do the three piece, but just don't balance. Um, over the charge station was very useful, especially at champs when you know you'd have. Uh, you'd have two robots running a three-piece, or um, one robot running a three-piece, one robot running a two-piece, and then that uh, center auto um, would be for the third robot. Number five here is like our backup. Where you um, and this one is very important to have. Um, um, us, um, because it's important to send you know, out plans get mistake, well in advance, uh, or uh, there are mechanical because issues. Because uh, who know, you know, you might show up to the so field and to get that your drive frame's broken or something teams. like that. So you need some backup plan um, to fall, fall back on. on um, media. We have some, um, and now, yeah, you know, the overall thinking here is like, our plan is not to go out and run the very highest scoring auto every match. Our plan is we look at the whole alliance and we say, what is the, the best you know, set and, of, uh, of no auto modes that all three teams can run? And sometimes, so, you know, you can, you can too, get more out of your partners in the qualification rounds really if you let them do part um, of this and you don't do the, like, super good uh, auto. Tasks, um, and, like, I showed, like, our auto EPA at the very beginning, but, you know, that EPA takes into account your partners that you were playing with in every match. So these teams that 
you know, have high contributions to auto, don't necessarily have the, the best auto, but they play, they, they play the best auto as an alliance. And, and choosing the set of uh, autonomous mode you develop um, can help your whole alliance do better. Um, another example here um, from 2022. Uh, it's a little simpler in 2022. Um, so, you know, the top one we wanted to do was uh, a five piece on the right side. Um, second one, if you know you're playing with another team that maybe they can only do an auto on the right side, well, you got to do something on the left side. So we have a two piece on the left. Um, number four, that's our backup plan again. Just shoot, shoot one ball and don't move. Um, we actually, we're originally shooting for a six piece, which some teams did, um, but we kind of realized that we've, we violated that last bullet point for the qual section we were thinking about doing the six piece, which it's just too hard to coordinate with everyone on your alliance. Like even if you could do all six pieces, there's nothing like reasonable for your partners to do in that case. Um, and, and a lot of teams can you know, pick up one ball and do, uh, shoot their preload. So the, the six piece ended up really not mattering. Sponsors know um, exactly what we're doing and we the sort of stopped working on it after we reevaluated re and realized it would So they know exactly how far we are um, with our robot. Right. And yeah, this one was fun. Um, if, you, if um, this was posted on Chief Delphi at some point. Um, we didn't, we didn't come up with it. Um, that the way the rules so were ri written was, it's not like this year where you just can't go across the line. There was nothing saying you couldn't go across that the white auto line in 2022. But it was just that so, you couldn't touch um, an opponent robot, these, uh, and you couldn't touch um, a ball on your opponent's side um, if it was still staged in the spot so, that it was set up in. Um, so you want to look into that. Um, I wish I could remember which team it was, um, but some teams, you know, evaluated the rules very carefully so and said, "Well, you know, what if we can make on? that piece be destaged? Um, and if it is destaged, then we could pick it up." Um, so we ended up doing, uh, developing a three piece that stole the piece off of our opponent's side. I have a video of this. To look after, or I can um, it so we now. pick up one, so we include shoot on both. The page, now we pick up this, uh, this ball here. This we use it to stick to that ball, right? And come back to our side and, and shoot the third up. ball. Um, yeah, the bumpers are the wrong color. So we were playing as blue there. So red was an opponent ball. We purposely pick up the opponent ball used to be stage. Um, and uh, when we when we played um, in the playoffs, um, we found out that our partner, 6328, also had that auto. Um, and theirs worked better than ours. Uh, so they, they actually ran it. Um, in the playoffs, so it's, would be like, it's, I know it's hard to see, but they're, they're over here. They shoot their two. They pick up this one. They actually turn around, do like a vision alignment on the third ball, destage it, drive in, and then shoot and score, So, um, which is super cool. Um, I love the, the wacky autonomous modes that people end up coming up with. Your finances and try to focus on that. All right. Uh, we also, I'm okay. So sponsor incentives. You've gone through this whole process and you figured like these are the auto autos we really want to run. Um, so so now it comes to like the robot architecture decision. Um, and you can make choices at this stage that are going to make your chances of success more likely later when you go to actually write these autonomous modes. Um, so, you know, sometimes you have to go with a certain robot architecture just to make it feasible at all. Um, and this, you know, is one of my favorite robots from my favorite game, 2014, um, and 254 here grabs both balls from their partners, drives forward with all three, and shoots all three into the goal here. Um, and so, you know, this, I mean, they won a lot of matches just in autonomous mode, that here, which is crazy. Um, and, uh, but this robot architecture is like, you can tell that, like, from day one, they knew they wanted to run this auto because However, um, you had to have an intake um, in the front and an intake in the back. Here and if you if you didn't have two intakes, um, this was this auto would be way more mentors. difficult to do. Um, so like that robot arch um, the, the, the autos were not an afterthought, right? Like that robot architecture was very intentional from the very beginning. Um, and so now this is this is an instance where it's not strictly necessary, but it helps you a lot. 
um, so 254 is so they know what's going on. Uh, over or here. Some kind of just um, so they drive across the field. Inquits and stuff can always go across the like midfield. They place their one cube. And you have the, um, but their robot architecture is designed so such that the game piece can, put, can put pass aside. through the robot, right? right? So they're just driving back and forth. They pick up on one side, the, the piece goes through the robot, and they drop it off on the other side. So you know, imagine if instead of being able to pass the game piece through, they had to do a full 180 turn to be able to pick up a piece, turn 180 degrees, drop off a piece. Um, that would have made the autonomous mode a lot more challenging to make um, because it, it would have been more taxing on the drivetrain. Doing an accurate turn, complete 180, um, and still driving is both slower and more difficult to you know, keep your odometry while you're doing it. Um, so this is another example of kind of like the, the dual intake strategy. Um, so uh, our 2022 robot had intakes on both sides. And so that let us just drive through the balls coming in. And now we don't have to turn at all. We just go sideways and, and curve a little bit to use the other intake to get balls from the human player station uh, hold, hold and then hold. come back and shoot base for those. Um, and so that meant we avoided some turning. Um, which usually makes your autonomous mode more repeatable. Like it's it's easier to just drive in a straight line back and forth than it is to um, you know do has, multiple who runs a business, you know full rotations of the robot and keep your X Y accurate. Um, that's kind of changing in the world of visual fiducials with April tags, but um, and then this is another example of the pass through, right? So just like two fifty four in twenty eighteen, um, we designed our robot with. Uh, what's essentially a pass through. So we pick up on the opposite side that we score on. Um, and that means for our, our autonomous mode, we really just have to drive back and forth with like a little curve there. Um, and so it's, it's both, uh, it's faster, potentially faster, um, but certainly a lot easier to keep your odometry accurate um, if you're relying heavily on your, your wheel odometry. Um, so, you know, in summary, there are choices you can make for your mechanical design that make your robot archit or make your autonomous development from the software side more likely to succeed. Um, and so when we're thinking about how we're going to design the robot at the beginning, that's you know something that is heavy on our mind. Um, so now I'm going to talk about how we go through the implementation. But before I do that, are there any questions uh, about? Our kind of process for coming up with uh, what autos we want to go make. We try to yeah, add that. And then. 59.40. We're a California team from uh, RoboC. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so the implementation of all this is non trivial. Um, and so kind of like to think about it as layers of control, um, where you have all these kind of subcomponents of your software that all need to do their job. Um, otherwise, the like end aut autonomous routine script is going to have trouble. And so we're going to talk through, uh, not necessarily individually, but we're going to talk through all these um, and the things we're thinking about while we're implementing them. Um, and first, we're going to look at the uh, motor control. Uh, so here we're talking specifically about like the drive and steer motor for your drivetrain. Um, for the uh, for the PID control of that, um, usually what we do is well, you know, now that we've developed it, we just reuse what we had the previous year. Um, but there's a lot of resources out there to you know pick where you'd want to start for that closed loop control. Um, you can look at another team's code. Um, a lot of the suppliers, like if you you know use the SDS Swerve modules. Um, we'll just have example code, and that'll include the, the closed loop PID parameters that they recommend. Um, or um, if you use Falcons and now Krakens, um, the CTRE, um, what is it, Phoenix, Phoenix Tuner, like includes a wizard that will actually generate um, a drivetrain software project that includes um, values for the PID tuning. Um, and so, is I. Do you need Pro to use the wizard? OK. I thought it was just Phoenix 6. But anyway, if, if you can't get to that, there's a lot of other places where you could find uh, constants. Um, and you know, I definitely recommend doing that, because then you, know, you can get driving very quickly 
um, and move on to your other software. Uh, but you should still test it, right? So, you know, command some angles to your swerve modules. Check that they go to that quickly and don't oscillate a lot. Um, look at the uh, achieved velocity um, of your robot while commanding it to move at a certain velocity forward. Um, there's a lot of options for how you can implement these control loops. Um, and so this, is, this has kind of been our experience on Bread. Um, we use the built-in um, PID control on the Talon FX, the uh, controller for the Falcon, all the time. I don't think, yeah, any of our low-level control is all on the motor controller. Um, Motion Magic works great. Um, the, uh, the big thing here is that these onboard control loops for uh, both the Talon and the Spark run far faster than they would on the Rio in your, in your robot code if you implemented the control code there. Um, and essentially what that means is that you can uh, use much higher gains without getting oscillation for a lot of systems. Um, not for all systems, but. Uh, so the control you can achieve is easier. Uh, there are a lot of teams that use control loops on the Rio very successfully. Um, 971 does that all the time. Um, but it's more difficult to have success with. Um, so this is what we do whenever we can. Um, the one thing I'll say about um, the PID and the Sparks, um, if you're using NEOs, just be aware that the um, encoder on the NEO is, has much lower resolution than it does on the Falcon. Um, so if you're using it for uh, position control, um, that resolution might be a problem, or might not. Um, but in particular, for motion profiling, um, the motion profiling on the Spark Max as opposed to the Talon is actually implemented with a velocity PID loop on the inside. Um, basically what that means is that um, if there's an issue following the trajectory on a Spark Max, uh, it won't necessarily go to the endpoint as consistently. You really want to be closing that loop on the actual position um, that the mechanism is using. Um, so if you do want to do motion profiling on Spark Max, I would recommend you, you actually do the motion profiling on the Rio and just command the position PID loop on the Spark. Um, it would probably be more successful that way. So tuning, I have um, a bunch of stuff on tuning here that I'll probably skip through faster than I intended to. Um, but uh, the, the tuning you know, is very important, um, especially for autonomous mode. You know, the, you're counting by the seconds. So, you know, we're trying to save like half a second at different parts. Um, so this is our elevator extending. Um, we've actually, it's actually faster than this now. Um, but so here I have it in slow motion. I think this is one quarter speed. Um, so the robot enables, elevator extends, arm goes down, and the robot starts driving away. Uh, but that was one quarter speed. Like this is what it looks like in real life. So it's, it's very fast, and now what it actually does is it doesn't wait for the elevator to fully stop before it slams down the cone, so it's even faster. Uh, but the reason it's, you know, we tried to make it so fast is because we wanted that time for the balance at the end of the procedure. Um, Any time we spent here, was less time we got to balance. So that's why we put so much effort into it. Um, there's a bunch of constants um, that we use when going through and tuning these PID loops. Um, I'm not going to talk through each one of these right now, um, but they're all important. Um, all these at the top are what we call feed forward constants. Um, and it's called feed forward because it, uh, it just follows a pre programmed uh, trajectory. Um, all the parts of this equation that determines the actual voltage command that goes out to your motor um, has nothing to do with where the mechanism actually is. Um, so there could be you know, a huge problem, like your the mechanism is physically stuck, and the code would happily run through the portions of this equation that yes. uh, use these parts um, without issue. And I'm going to do the same thing every time. Um, but these parts down here, which is our classic P, I, and D, um, actually use the error. So it'll track where the mechanism is supposed to be at any time, and then uh, try to correct for it. Um, but these feedback terms are actually very important. Um, because it makes the 
amount of corrections that your feedback has to do uh, a lot less. Um, and effectively, what that means is you can use higher games. Um, this, is, uh, this is a screenshot from the Phoenix 6, um, which is the, the new API for the Falcons, which uses sensible units. Um, and uh, so you can see how all these map to what I've got on the left. Um, but the thing I wrote here uh, is the units that these games operate on. Um, I think a lot of times people approach control loop tuning as kind of like a nebulous concept where P, I, and D don't really mean anything, and you're just trying to tweak it until you get close. Um, and you know there is tuning involved, but these no these these values have real world meanings. Um, so for Phoenix Six, like your KP term is how many volts are you going to apply for how many um, how far off in uh, rotations of the motor you are. Um, and keeping those units in mind makes it easier to come up with like a sensible guess um, for where you're going to start with your tuning, especially for the feed forwards. Um, so tuning uh, G and S, this is, like, this is like the process we go through. Um, so uh, KG is your gravity offset. So think about this like an elevator or an arm. Um, so the first step is we want to uh, figure out how many volts to the motor it takes in order just to keep the, um, the elevator like uh, suspended, right? To offset its gravity. Um, and so we do that by you know, cranking up kg. You can, you can use the fact, you can use the uh, uh, model of a motor if you want to come up with like a good guess for this, or you can just kind of crank it up until the mechanism supports itself. Um, you can also do some more tests and figure out what the static feed forward should be for like the static friction in your mechanism. Um, we'll move on from that. Um, so after you, you know, figure out what that gravity offset should be, uh, we move on to uh, the velocity feed forward. Um, so this, um, if you imagine you're the uh, elevator following a profile, right, it needs to accelerate. There's some portion where um, it's traveling at a constant velocity, and then it needs to decelerate before it uh, comes to a stop ultimately. Um, so you have something like this, right? If this is your elevator position, um, there's like an acceleration portion, and then during this portion, it's traveling at constant velocity, and during this portion, you're decelerating. Um, so this KV basically says uh, at any point in this profile that the uh, motion magic on a talon or a smart motion on a smart max, the uh, profile it's, it's trying to follow. Um, if at this point in the profile, we want to be spinning at you know, 10 rotations per second, um, which would translate to some linear motion for an elevator, um, we're going to apply this many volts. Um, so essentially, if you're supposed to be going faster, it's going to give it more volts. Um, and so we tune all this graphically. So uh, look at, a, you know, you'll, you'll see your intended position, something like this. Um, and you take a good guess for KV. Um, and uh, if you look at the actual achieved uh, profile of your mechanism, it might look something like this. Right, like the slope of the, this line is, is shallower than the slope of this line, and you kind of end, end up not at the uh, right position at the end. Um, remember, P, I, and D are all still zero at this point. We haven't done any feedback control yet. Um, so looking at something like that graphically, um, we'd probably want to add more KV. Um, and what you're hoping to see is something like this. So um, the, the part we're focusing on is that the achieved slope during the, the cruise section, the constant velocity section, is the same as the slope during the constant velocity section of uh, our set point. Um, the fact that it overshoots at the end, that's fine. The fact that it like the lags behind at the beginning, that's fine. I'm trying to get these slopes to match. Because um, we'll fix the top and bottom in the next step. Um, so this is the acceleration coefficient. Um, and this one's new. I think it just, it was like, it added in Phoenix 6. Um, and so uh, this is the coefficient that looks at the profile and says, how fast is the mechanism supposed to be accelerating right now? So, you know, are we speeding up at the very beginning? Are we slowing down? Um, and if we're speeding up, it's going to give it extra voltage. If we're slowing down, 
Um, it'll give it negative voltage. Um, and uh, so this is going to help with those beginning and end sections. So we add some of that KV term, and that'll give us extra kick at the beginning to get up to speed. And then it'll, same thing at the end, in order to get closer to the end result. But there's still error through all this. Like, they're not going to match exactly. Yeah. And so you know, once we've got something good, like pretty, pretty good alignment, um, only then do we go on to the actual P PID terms. Um, and the first one, and the most important one, is, is the P term. So um, basically, we just add more KP um, until either the position tracks as well as we want, and we just stop there. Um, or uh, we see oscillations, and then we back off. Um, but remember, like the control will already look very good if those feed forward steps earlier. And then for I and D, um, right, so you'd expect it to be like on top of each other at this point. Um, for I and D, we just set them to zero. Uh, yes. Uh, so <laughs> the whole point of the like feed forward section of this is that there should be very little work at the end for the PID controller to do. Um, and like, I don't think we've used the I term on our robots. Well, it's certainly not on bread, but you know, while I was doing FRC before this, one of the ways we really haven't used the, the I term for a long time. Sometimes we use KD, like um, but it's like really small compared to KD. It's like two orders of magnitude lower on our sort motors. We don't have to yeah. pay those fees. And, oh, thanks. Yeah, so this is, this is my next slide. Fantastic question. Um, so, you know, we need to do all this graphically. Um, so on bread, um, we use advantage kit for logging. Um, and then we look at those logs with advantage scope. Um, if you're doing it live, you don't need to use advantage kit. You just pull up advantage scope, put stuff into network tables. Um, but even if you don't want to do any of that, you could pull up um, the uh, Phoenix Tuner, Phoenix Tuner X. Um, and there's a mode where you can just, you know, click on the talon that's driving your elevator um, and just tell it to plot the position set point and the achieved position. And, you know, without any extra robot code, you can see those graphs. Um, and doing this with plots is, like, super key. Um, it would be almost impossible to do this. To do this well, if, if there if you didn't have a, a plotting utility, so hi, highly recommend this. Um, so that's the PID stuff. Um, the next the next section go a little quicker. Um, so uh, we use um, April tags and uh, cameras during our autonomous routines. Um, if you're setting up a system to do April tag detection with cameras, um, there's a couple things to keep in mind. Um, you have to do uh, a lens calibration and then a position calibration. So the lens calibration is basically figuring out the shape of the lens on your camera. Um, and this is really important for doing April tag detection. Otherwise, the algorithm can't figure out you know, how small in the image translates to how far away you are without this calibration. Um, this is a video from the Photon Vision documents um, showing you know, with their UI in the web page how you would go through and do that lens calibration. Um, they make it very easy. Um, and then for uh, positional calibration, this is just figuring out where your cameras actually are relative to um, like the center of your robot. Um, the X, Y, and Z are pretty easy to figure out. Um, but you also need to figure out the rotation of the camera. Um, and particularly when you're far away from a tag, that angle is going to translate to a big difference in the calculated position of your robot. Um, so it's, it's really important to, you know, set up the robot at multiple spots around the field, look at the tags, see where that translates to for your robot position, check that that is actually where the robot is, and potentially adjust the position uh, offset for your camera. Um, and if, if something went bad with the lens cow, you also might get, like, really weird results at this stage. Um, so that's cameras. Um, another important part of the, like, layers of control is uh, the effective wheel radius. So, um, um, yes. you know, there's plenty of wheel options. So um, the thing is, and 
for the autonomous routine using your drivetrain odometry, basically keeping track of how far each wheel turned to figure out where you are in the field. Um, we need to know what the radius of the wheel is to be able to calculate that. Um, and you might think that you can just like take out a tape measure and, me and measure it, and you can, it would be close, um, but it's not gonna be exactly accurate. Um, the interaction of these wheels with the carpet is, is not straightforward. Um, so the easiest thing to do is just to test it. Um, set up the robot on the field, uh, push it or drive it, um, and do a correlation between how far the robot thinks it went to how far it actually went. Record that in your code. Um, that way you can use those encoders later on to do your odometry. Um, one thing to keep in mind here is that the type of wheel you choose is gonna matter a lot. Um, so teams that are trying to get good odometry data generally go for traction wheels. Um, this, the interaction of all the, um, the rough tread on here with the carpet creates a, an interaction that's more like, uh, like a gear on a rack in pinion where they're kind of like locked into each other. Um, whereas Colson's traditionally um, people thought had more slip. Um, there's been some discussion about you know, whether or not it might actually be that bad, but the standards definitely go to the rough, rough top tread for now. Um, but like if you chose Omni wheels for your robot, you're probably gonna have a really hard time trying to do drivetrain odometry. Um, next step is the absolute location PID control. This is what actually implements the like following of the robot. Um, it's also a PID controller. Um, if we're talking swerve um, for X, Y, and rotation, um, they operate separately, kind of trying to drive the robot to follow along its uh, plan trajectory. Centrifusion. So if you have this data from your drivetrain uh, for how far all the wheels have rotated and you know that information for where the robot is on the field. Um, and then we also have this information for where the cameras are saying the robot is on the field. Um, we have to somehow use those together to ideally figure out better um, where the robot is. Um, your camera measurements are generally you know, lower update rate um, than your drivetrain measurements are, which is you know, high frequency. Um, and these, these complement each other because your, you know, your drivetrain is able to tell you, hey, since the last update, you probably moved an inch in this direction. The April tags are able to tell you, you're on this position uh, on the field. Like you are you know, two feet away from the charge station. Um, and by using them together, we can get um, a fast updating, but also accurate idea of where the robot is. Um, and this is usually done with something called a Kalman filter, um, which is built into WPI, uh, WPI lib. Um, but it does have, there's also yet another element of tuning here um, and tuning how much trust that you give to the, uh, the vision uh, information over the drivetrain. Um, and essentially, if you, if you trust the vision data a lot, um, you're gonna observe jitter in your pose. So a new vision measurement will come in, there'll be some error, and the pose, estimated pose of the robot will jump a lot. Um, but if you don't trust the camera data a lot, then the pose will be uh, much more stable, but it might be less accurate. Um, so there's this like element of tuning to uh, get an accurate robot pose that doesn't jitter too much. Yeah. Um, I think in the way WPI Lib implements it, um, there's, there's actually only one trust number, you tune. Um, or uh, there might be two, but the only thing that really matters is like the ratio between them. Um, so you're really only tuning one number. Um, and so, you know, the, there's a lot of theory as to like how this stuff works and, you know, People will, you know, become actual roboticists and like PhDs on this. I don't have one of those PhDs, um, but I, you know, I know how to tune one of these things for FRC. Um, and uh, we do it, you know, you, and this is what I'm saying here is like, you can do scientific measurements to figure out what like the standard deviation really should be for these systems. Um, but at the end of the day, you're trying to get something that just works. Um, and so this is the tuning process. Um, so there's, yeah, there's not really an aspect of um, which one do you trust more. It's just the ratio of how much you trust each of them. That's the part that matters for how much jitter you end up getting in the localization. Okay. 
um, yeah, application code. Um, so we're going to go through this pretty quick. Um, we've kind of exited the like performance elements of an autonomous routine, right? Um, at this part, kind of like, how do you want to write your code? Uh, there's many ways to just kind of kind of go through what Bread does, um, why we do it, but you know, you can absolutely be very successful doing it a different way, and most teams do it a different way. Uh, we set up everything in state machines. Um, so our robot has an elevator, it's got a floor intake, um, and they kind of exist in these different sorts of states. Um, so you can see like the elevator, the elevator doesn't actually have like a homing switch. Um, it just uh, comes down and senses when it uh, has, when the current increases, so it knows it hit the bottom. Um, so there's like a state for doing that homing procedure. There's a state for uh, just being idle. There's a state for following, uh, going to a certain place. Um, but then we have this like big state machine, hop level, that describes all the things the robot could possibly be doing at any time. Uh, so, you know, the robot could be uh, throwing a cone. The robot could be uh, exhausting a cube low. Um, and so this just kind of describes all the possible things the, the robot could be doing. Um, and the way that code is set up, um, I'm going to show it through an example. So this is our floor cone intake procedure. Um, so this is pretty fast, right? Comes up, gets a cone, does this like wacky flip thing, ends up in the uh, arm on the elevator. Um, and so that actually just went through four states in our state machine. So we started out in floor intake cone A. This is basically saying the floor intake is pointed at the ground. Um, and uh, the driver is driving uh, into a cone. Um, and it's looking at the current on the floor intake um, and checking if it's above a value. Um, and so what that's doing there is when, when a cone gets wedged in, um, it will cause the current consumed by the floor intake to spike. Um, and so our, <laughs> our threshold there is 55 amps. Um, so if time. you're wondering like what current limits we run on things, our current limits are pretty high. Um, and uh, so now down here, uh, if that's if that's happened, it starts to lift the uh, floor intake. Um, and then if the floor intake has been lifted and the roller RPM is installed, um, then we transition into the next state. Um, so then uh, this one's pretty simple. It kind of just moves the elevator into position. Um, the next one now is the, the elevator in the arm comes down into the cone, um, and there's actually a beam brake sensor inside the arm that's looking for the cone to be fully seated. Um, and so it's, it's waiting for that to happen before it transitions out. We didn't used to have this, um, and used to actually use the current as well, um, but we had trouble making that consistent. Sometimes it, you know, the current would spike because it was trying to like center the cone, um, and then it would go up too quickly. So we ended up adding an actual sensor to know that the cone had fully gone in. And only once the, the cone had gone in does it transition to the next state. So you know, the, the format here is we got our outputs. This is you know, setting, the, uh, setting the floor intake to go to a certain angle or moving the elevator. And then we have the transitions. So that's, has something happened? If it has, we're gonna move into one of the next states. And if this is successful now, um, we just end up in the idle state. Um, and uh, there's some extra logic in here that says, you know, if the beam break is triggered, that means we have a cone, and it holds the cone harder than it would a cube. Um, but all that together, you, you end up with this, uh, with this procedure. Um, so I'll just, oh. Well, you guys already saw it. Um, but it goes through those four states very quickly. Yeah, so the superstructure only exists in one of those states at any time. Um, and the reason we, we use this structure is because it makes it very easy to think about the code. Um, you know, I, in previous iterations, we've gone through, and, and if you don't do this sort of state architecture, I find the code gets very hard to understand, or it's easy to have mistakes that are hard to find. Um, this, this state uh, gets logged on our robot. Um, so at any time, we can... We can be like, oh, that procedure didn't work well. Well, like, what state was it in at that time? Um, and we can see, like, huh, it was only in the floor intake cone B state for like a single cycle of the code. Should have taken longer than that. Let's go look. Yeah. 
Um, this, well, this state machine stuff is just like our code structure. There's, there's no library for that. Um, but yeah, yeah, for you know the motors, we're using CTRE's libraries. Yeah. And your auto is just in state. Basically, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's that's what I have next. Um, so like then your, your autonomous routines look really simple. Um, this is our place one piece in balance. And so it's just um, stop the drivetrain, score your piece, um, then follow a trajectory, uh, and then stop again. Um, so like this is a simple one, but this is our three-piece floor cone um, that I showed the video of earlier. Um, and even though there's more here, it's you know it's still really not that complicated. It's just these these five is like score cone high. These couple here is go in the intake cone position while driving back, um, and then this one is uh, score a cone with vision alignment, um, intake a cube while driving out and back. Um, score the cube, drive back to midfield for better field position. Um, but so like these these commands, um, it's the same that gets used when we're driving around in teleop, right? If 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 the driver presses like the the cone intake button, um, it does the same thing of just uh, request. It just calls the super tells the superstructure to go into the floor intake cone position. Um, yeah. And so you can you can see it go through all those steps. Um, we've already seen this video before. Um, so now this is a real big takeaway here, is that almost everything in this list can be done before the season starts, right? You know, your team can develop the you know experience doing the the drive and steer motor control. Can can do the wheel calibration for the wheels you think you'll probably use next year. Can set up your April tag detection system. Try out tuning a Kalman filter. Set up your PID control for path following. Get experience with like the code layout for these things. And then when the season rolls around, you kind of just set up a state machine for the robot and then do a couple commands to write an autonomous mode. Um, and having all this done ahead of time, I think, is what has enabled us to develop those autonomous modes so quickly. Um, like this, this last year, we showed a video of a robot doing a three-piece autonomous after like a couple weeks after kickoff. Um, thing with that six ball autonomous video that I showed you from 2022. Um, because we do all this before the season starts, you know, we're not trying to figure out these issues during the season, which is you know, really the big, the big win um, of this strategy, I think. Um, so some final takeaways. Um, just like I said, if, if you can do it before the season, <laughs> do it before the season. I, I can't stress that enough. Um, you know, it's tough. Like, we're, we're not perfect. Uh, it's sometimes hard to, you know, motivate the team to work on some of this foundational stuff during, this, uh, during the off season. But the, it, you really uh, reap the rewards if you do this in the off season. Um, Think critically about what you should do in auto, right? There's many possible auto modes you could write, um, but you know, think about what you're trying to do in the qualifications. Think about where your team might slot in to a playoff alliance, and and make the auto that is going to make that alliance most successful. Um, resist the temptation to move higher in the layer stack. I used to um, remotely mentor a team, and this was always the thing I kept telling them was. Um, all those, all those pieces in the stack, they work off each other. So you know, if, if you didn't spend enough time to make sure that your swerve and drive motors had good PID control, and you went to try path following, well, it would be really hard to tell which of these pieces like, wasn't working right. Um, is it the, the path following PID? Is it like the PID of the drive motors themselves? It's hard to know if you don't stair step all of these up and build them on top of each other um, to get to these higher layers. Um, it's really difficult to like unwind this in the season. Be like, oh well, maybe like this lower block is is broken. Um, tune graphically. Uh, that was like your question, right? It's so much easier to to do this um, to do it graphically. Um, test unforgivingly. Um, you know, we we run our autonomous modes in the in the shop so many times before we run them on the competition field. Um, and like our threshold is like it needs to work every time, because if it doesn't work every time in our shop, 
guaranteed we're going to go to the field and it's going to work like maybe half the time. Um, and the last one is be skeptical of hardware problems. Um, you know, code rarely just like stops working if you haven't updated the code. Um, like the other day um, before we went to Chessy Champs, uh, we just were like, okay, well, we're going to run through our auto modes and make sure they still work. And we tried it, and the path flying was like all over the place. Totally didn't work. Um, and, uh, you know, we took a look at the, me the mechanical stuff on the robot and figured out that one of the drive motors for the swerve drivetrain uh, wasn't producing torque. So it was, you know, it was really hard to tell at the, at the onset because uh, the lights were still green. Like it showed that it was being driven, but we looked at the actual current consumed by the motor and it wasn't consuming current such that it would be producing torque. So the robot was just driving on three wheels. Um, and that's why the path following was different now. Um, so, you know, be skeptical of those hardware problems. The code worked last time and if the code hasn't changed, maybe something on the robot actually broke. Um, but we replace the motor. Um, ask CTRE for an RMA. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's all I got. Um, any questions? Yeah. Uh, I'm one of the technical mentors. I do mostly software. Um, yeah, we have other mechanical mentors, but um, like I said at the beginning, like there's a lot of strategy to it too. Yeah. That's a question for him. Yes. Okay. I think they're recording it too, so. Cool. Any, uh, any other questions? I'll stick around for a bit if people have like more one-on-one -on -one questions. Um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming guys. I hope it was uh, informative. Good luck at the competition.